with you now. So if you'll take your Bibles up into Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession the, to the, unto the praise of his glory. Again, as I always say, may God bless us as we study his word together. So I want you to remember that the last things we saw and the first seven verses of this chapter were the fact that Jesus in eternity past, God the Father, and Jesus, God the Son, chose us before the foundation of the world. Before we were ever born, God already had his eyes on us. He had chosen us. And uh, the question is, again, as I always say, have or do we choose him in return? And then uh, we saw, that was in verse 4. Then we saw in verse 5 that he has predestinated us. And that's not hard to understand. It just simply means that he has chosen us. And if we have chosen him in return, then he has thus knowing whether we would receive him or reject him has predestinated us unto salvation. And then we saw in verse 7 that he has redeemed us. So he chose us, he has predestinated us, and he has redeemed us. As it says to us that he has, we are redeemed in Christ and uh, through his shed blood and we have the forgiveness of sins. Now, let's look at verse 9 together. It says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. This thing of uh, him choosing us, predestinating us, and redeeming us, God has given this to us and by way of, of uh, an abundance of his blessing. And Danny, I don't know, but I'm, I'm hearing, does anybody hear a feedback on this microphone? All right, I can continue going as is, but just to let you know. But um, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God is wise. And prudence means good judgment. It was in the wisdom of God that he chose us, predestinated us, and redeemed us. And it was good judgment on his part. It's a good thing that he did that because it means... We don't have to die lost and go to hell, but we can live forever in heaven one day. He is the all-wise and prudent God. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, what does that mean, having made known unto us the mystery of his will? Well, it means this. The mystery is the fact that God sent his son to be our savior. Again, as I quoted this morning, John 3, 16, that very familiar verse to us all, 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That was a mystery to uh, the, many of the folks in the Old Testament. They had a general vague idea of what God might do, but they didn't really know exactly. It was a mystery to them. And uh, Moses didn't know about it. David didn't know about it. Abraham didn't know about it. Noah didn't. Elijah didn't. They didn't know. It was a mystery to them. And the mystery of God offering salvation to whosoever would call upon him to usher in the age of the church or the age of grace, that mysterious thing to the people of the Old Testament was made known to the apostles who then preached it to the people. And uh, so Paul is just simply saying, look at it, verse 9, having made known unto us, who is us there? Paul is talking about himself and the other apostles. Having made known unto us, said Paul, this mystery of his will. And, and by the way, in Colossians chapter 1, 25 and 26, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. Colossians 1, 25 and 26, Paul said this to the church of Colossae, wherefore, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, said Paul, which hath been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So it's a mystery that God gave unto the apostles like John and like Paul, who then in turn shared it with the churches of that day. And, and, the, and as I said this morning, the churches of that day, they, it was historically for them, but it is spiritually applicable to us, the church of today. Now, it was according to his good pleasure that he did that. See that in verse 9? Or verse 10, rather? Yeah, verse 9. It was to his pleasure, his good pleasure, that he did that. When, you know, God chose everyone to be saved, whosoever will call upon him shall be saved. Not everyone in life does call upon him, as many reject him. And again, at the snap of my finger, people just died and went to hell because people reject him all the time, every day. And, uh, and that's, you know, God doesn't want that. He wants people to be saved. He's not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he wants us to choose him and return him. When we do, it's to his pleasure that he then predestinates us unto redemption and salvation and to our eternal home in heaven. It is his good pleasure, is, is, the, is, is his will, his desire, which is a mystery to those in the Old Testament, but is made known to us in the New Testament era, in the great age of the church, or in the age of grace. It is his good pleasure. Uh, whenever we walk down that aisle, this aisle, or some other aisle, or wherever it was when we got saved, on that particular day in our life, when we confessed and acknowledged and repented of our sins and received him as our Savior, we were washed in the blood. We were forgiven of our sins. We were radically and completely and thoroughly, unbelievably saved by the Savior. And it was his good pleasure to do it. He did it because he wanted to, because he loved us. And it's his good pleasure to do it, which he hath purposed in himself. It's all about him. It's not about, you know, I don't come here. I, I, there, I, there are a lot of times that I will preach verses from the Old Testament, and I'll make reference to people like Noah and, um, and Abraham and Moses and David and Elijah and Elisha and some of those. And, and, and I will make mention of people in the New Testament like John and like Paul and uh, like Peter and others. But it's not about any of those individuals. It's all about Jesus. He's the one who is the Savior. He is the Lamb of God. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the one who came to offer this uh, salvation that we have become recipients of, beneficiaries of. Uh, Jesus, is said, is purposed in himself. 
Then we go to verse 10 here. Look at it with me. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times. You know what that means? That means that there's going to come a time when um, Jesus is going to come back to this earth and he's going to usher in his millennial 1,000 year reign on this earth. Lost people will not be entering into this millennial reign. It will be the saved. And what a world it's going to be when we are with Jesus for this thousand year period of time. And um, this is what uh, Paul, how he described it in Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11. So just listen to this. Christ being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That is Jesus coming from the throne of glory in heaven to be uh, incarnated into human flesh as the little baby born in Bethlehem who grew to become the man who would die on the cross. And verse 8 says, being found in fashion as a man, he then humbled himself and, as I said, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a lot of people that are not in church tonight and don't come to church a lot of times who have been saved I would imagine that's between them and the Lord, but not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, said Jesus, will make it into heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is uh, Jesus said, but you know, there's some people that say I'm saved and they're not here for whatever reasons. And uh, many of them are saved still and uh, yet yeah, won't come to praise God here. There's going to come a time when we're all going to get down on our knees. You so say, I can't get down on my knees, Pastor Randy, because i got bad knees. I've, I've got reconstructed knees. Or Look, when we, when we stand before him one day, we're going to be in new glorified bodies. And it ain't going to hurt us to get down on our knees. And we're going to have a desire to do that. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Kathleen, even with that reconstructed hip, you're going to get down on your knees, aren't you? Yeah. Amen. So, in the dispensation of time of the... The fullness of times he might gather together in one all who were in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Now, it goes on then, it says in verse 11, would you look there with me? It says in verse 11, that in Christ, or in whom, is, that means Christ, in, in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. He has obtained an inheritance as well. You know, as I've said before, Jesus is rich. He is rich in that he is on the throne of, of heaven. He owns the world, but he gave it all up and became poor so that we can be spiritually rich. But um, he has gained an inheritance, and that is being the church, his bride. For those of us in life who have lived in the past or living now or ever will live and will receive Christ as our Savior, we are, in a sense, his inheritance. We belong to him, and we are valuable to him. But not only are we his inheritance, our salvation is our inheritance. So there is another verse I want to read to you. First Peter. First Peter, got papers here with scripture all around. The first Peter chapter one, three and four says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. You know, you can have an inheritance of money and you can let it accumulate in the bank or at home. But uh, money is uh, a material thing that can, uh, it, it, it's, it won't last forever. But we have an inheritance that is incorruptible. It is undefiled and it fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven for you. We have a reservation, folks. 
we have a reservation to our eternal home on the other side. And uh, it's an inheritance, our eternal life, our everlasting life, our salvation in Jesus. And praise God for this inheritance that we have. And it tells us in verse 11 then of Ephesians chapter 1, In Christ we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose or the plan of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God had a plan in eternity past before this world was even created. And before we were ever born, before we were ever conceived in our mother's womb, God had already had a plan of how he's going to save us. He already chose us and had hoped that we would choose him in return. And those of us who have chosen him in return, he has predestined us and he has redeemed us and is all in his purpose and in his plan. And he has worked all of these things out according to the counsel of his divine, perfect and holy will. Amen? Amen. Now, verse 12, we are going to see a reference made to Jewish Christians, Jewish Christians in the early church. In uh, verse 13, we're going to see a reference made to Gentile Christians. And then in verse 14, the last verse that we'll look at here this evening is in reference to all Christians. So let's first look at verse 12. And we can tell this by looking at the pronouns. Because Paul said, we, he's talking about, see, Paul was a, a, a Jewish man by his nationality and his birth. Paul was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Why, he, at one time, when his name was Saul, before he met Jesus on Damascus Road, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. He was a very religious man, but you know what? One can be religious and bust hell wide open if they don't know Jesus. So religion doesn't cut it. Religion isn't enough. Religion doesn't get anyone into heaven. In fact, to be quite honest with you, it was religion that put Jesus on the cross. The religious leaders, that was part of the reason he went to the cross. But Paul said, we should be to the praise that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now Paul is talking there about all of the Jewish people who had received Christ. Perhaps among the 3000 that got saved on the day of Pentecost and then the church began to grow incredibly from there and they'd gone to 5000 and and then many more. And most of those people there were in Judea. They were in Jerusalem and that surrounding area. Many of them had gotten saved. There was the, the old religion, uh, religious leaders of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the elders and the scribes, all who just adamantly refused to recognize Jesus as being the Messiah. In fact, they gloried and the fact that he died on the cross, they rejected him. Yeah, it says in John 1, 11 and 12, he came into his own, his own received him not, but them, to they who received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. So he came into his own, his own as a whole received him not. But that being said, can I tell you that in Israel today, there is a remnant of Christians. There is a remnant, and we find that in Romans chapter 11, verse 5, where it says, even so then at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to his election of grace. Election of grace, his choosing by grace. God chose all the world, and that includes the Jews and the Gentiles. In fact, in Paul's ministry, he would always preach to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. But there is a remnant in Israel even today of true born-again children of God. And then at the same time, there are many who still flatly reject the Messiah, the Christ. Now, we then go on and we find that he said, we are the ones who first trusted Christ. Then verse 13, he said, whom ye, now the pronoun is you, 
he said, we, now he says, you, ye trusted, uh, also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel of your salvation. Okay, so there we find Paul saying that many of you, why is he saying you? Because he's preaching or writing, I should say, a letter to the church of Ephesus and Ephesians who were predominantly Gentile people, Gentiles who had gotten saved, who had come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. So then he went on saying, he, he first of all said, we Jewish Christians, now he's saying you Gentile Christians in places like Ephesus and other churches. He said, you trusted after you heard. They heard, verse uh, 13 also says they believed, and then it says they were sealed. They heard, they believed, and they sealed. As far as heard goes, Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So those Ephesians got saved by hearing the word of God. Amen? Now, it then goes on and he said, not only have you heard, but you believed. You believed. Well, you know, John three sixteen, the verse I quoted a little bit ago, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In John 6, 35, Jesus said, He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth, believeth on me shall never thirst. And then there's Romans 10, 10, where it says that for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we believe. When we believe, we get saved. And that's what happened then with this church, the church of, of Christians and the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, they heard the gospel, they believed the gospel, and thus they were then saved. And not only were they saved, but they were sealed by the Holy Spirit. They were sealed. See that? You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That means that our soul, which is eternal, everlasting, the devil cannot touch it. And our salvation that we have from God, he cannot steal it from us. It tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But he cannot steal and kill and destroy Christians. Oh, he might steal, kill, and destroy us externally in our physical realm of living, but not spiritually on the inside because he cannot touch our soul. Amen. Now, which is the earnest. Many of you have heard of that word or that term earnest. It's kind of like a down payment. Now, suppose you were to go to a car dealership tomorrow and spend $375,000 on a car because that's about what they cost now, right? <laughs> anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But suppose you were to go to a car dealership, not, not far from that, but anyway... Suppose you were to go and you pick out a car, brand spanking new, right there on the lot. And you tell the salesman, I want that car. I want it. I'm going to buy it. So he says to you, all right, then you've got to put a down payment on it. And then we'll set up a payment plan. Oh, I, I can't give you a down payment. I, I've got the money. I'm going to pay cash in full. But say it's on Monday. So you say, I won't have the money to give to you until this weekend, Friday. I can be back Friday. And the, and the, the man says, but you got to put a down payment on this car. Now just hold it for me. I promise. I promise I'll be back Friday with the money. I, I don't want to give a down payment. Just hold it for me. All right. He says, go on then. Tuesday morning, somebody comes in and says, I want to buy that car. You got to put a down payment on it. They put a down payment on it. It's sold. The other man comes in on Friday, where's that car? We sold it. You weren't willing to put a down payment on it. So that being said, let me tell you. What verse is it in 1 Corinthians chapter 
Uh, 6, where it's talking about our body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, it says that we are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're bought with a price. Okay? So, we are bought and redeemed by the shed blood of Christ. He paid for it in full. Now, in John chapter 14, 1 through 3, Jesus told his disciples, that's before he died on the cross and resurrected. But he told them, I'm going to come back and get you one day. I promise. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my father's house for many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. That where I am there, you may be also. All right. What if Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected and he just left mankind on this earth without the Holy Spirit in them and made us that promise that he'll come back. Well, we might lose faith and say, I just don't believe it because we wouldn't have the Holy Spirit living in us. But we know Jesus is coming back one day because he has given us the down payment that is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. That's the earnest. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit who lives in us That is the biggest, most important evidence that he is going to come back one day and gather us and take us home. It is the earnest of our inheritance. Our inheritance is our eternal life in heaven by way of salvation through his amazing grace. Now, our soul, which is eternal, is redeemed. It has been redeemed, but our bodies have not. So he has not completed the process as of yet because our bodies get old, they get sick, and they die. Therefore, the whole process of redemption has not taken place yet. And that's what it means here in this verse when it says, until the redemption of the purchased possession. We have been purchased by the blood of Christ. That is redemption. We belong to him. And when he comes back one day and raptures the church and everyone else who's gone on before us resurrect from the dead, that is going to complete the process as we'll have our redeemed, physical, new glorified bodies. So, therefore, we have the earnest, in the meantime, the Holy Spirit to live in, with, and through us. He's the earnest. He is God's down payment of our inheritance of eternal life until the day we receive the total, complete process of redemption through uh, of the purchased possession, which is our life, unto the praise and the glory of God. We have reason to give God glory, honor, and praise. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. We have reason to praise him and to give him glory because he chose us, has predestinated us, and has redeemed us through the shed blood of his of his son. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for listening.